This is Dr. Steve with Rockwall CPR. Stop the bleed. You should take a live class so you can practice the skills, but use this as a prep for a live class and a review after the live class. These are the organizations involved in creating the Stop the Bleed program. Some of the images shown during this presentation may be disturbing to some people. Why do you need this training? The number one cause of preventable death after injury is bleeding. Bleeding is the most common cause of preventable death after injury and must be stopped as soon as possible. In Americans up to age 46, hemorrhage secondary to trauma is the leading cause of death. It is a common and serious medical emergency that requires early detection and appropriate intervention. What is hemorrhage? An acute loss of blood from a damaged blood vessel. Hemorrhage can manifest in many ways, depending on the mechanism and anatomic location. As we know, especially these last couple of years, where can you use this training? Unfortunately, you may need to use it anywhere where you are. So what are the goals of the program? Identify, recognize life-threatening bleeding. And then number two, stop the bleed. How do we do this? Here we go. Personal safety. Your safety is your first priority. If you are injured, you can't help others. Help others only when it's safe to do so. Survey the scene. If the situation changes or becomes unsafe, stop, move to safety, and if you can, take the victim with you. Your safety is your first priority. If you have gloves, wear them. Let's look at the different situations that you're in and where might you carry gloves? In the back of the car, certainly, and even if you're out and about, gloves are easy to carry. If you get blood on you, be sure to clean that part of the body thoroughly. And if you need to, go to a healthcare provider and you can tell them that you got blood on you. But what's important to know is as long as you don't have any cuts or open wounds, the skin is a pretty good barrier. The ABCs of bleeding control. Alert 911. Dial those three numbers into your phone and you'll start the emergency management system in your area. B is for bleeding and C is for compress. So how do we call 911? Just simply dial it on your phone. Emergency call centers do have different trainings for their emergency call operators. In some parts of the country, the emergency call centers have very high level training and the people there can talk you through pretty much anything. But in other parts of the country, it's not so good. So it's really important that you know what the situation is. Uh, we are here in Texas, just outside of the Dallas area. And I can tell you that the 911 call center people are phenomenally well trained. Know your location and do your best to give instructions as to where you are when you call. Never hang up. Bleeding. Find the source of the bleeding. Is it continuous bleeding? Is it a large volume of blood? Is there pooling of blood? There may be multiple places the victim is bleeding and clothing may hide life-threatening bleeding. Think of the winter time in heavy coats, a down coat could hold a liter or more of blood. Those fluffy boots can hold tremendous amounts of blood. So you may need to really remove clothing. If you see red spots, you definitely need to remove the clothing and check thoroughly each area. Arms and legs, neck, armpits, groin, and the body. So what are we going to do first for bleeding? We're going to compress. Apply direct pressure to the wound. That's hard pressure. Focus on the location of the bleeding. Use enough gauze or cloth. A t-shirt will work fine. If pressure stops the bleeding, maintain that pressure until help arrives. So here you go. Here is a sample of a wound. And here is how to apply pressure. 
and hold it on. Hold it on tight. Push hard so you're going to stop the bleed. What do we do for a bloody nose? What are the causes of a bloody nose? Fingers in the nose, a deviated septum, dry air, trauma, high blood pressure, medical conditions, bleeding disorders, blood thinner medication, anti-inflammatory medication like aspirin and ibuprofen, somebody who uses lots of the nasal steroid sprays, and unfortunately cocaine. Who? Well, are you a mom or dad? The little kids, ages two to 10. Are you a little bit older, 50 plus? About 10% are severe enough to need emergency care. There's a rupture of the blood vessel in the anterior or front of nose or posterior further back in the nose. What do you do? Have the person sit up straight or slightly forward. Do not tilt the head back. Pinch the nose below the bony area on the cartilage. So feel your nose, feel that bony area slide underneath it toward the mouth and pinch both sides even if it's only bleeding out of one side. Hold the pressure till the bleeding stops. This is the biggest problem with nosebleeds, especially with the little ones. You have to hold it there for five minutes or so. And I know that's a long time to hold pressure on the nose. I've had a lot of personal experience with it. Don't keep checking. You may have to hold up to 15 minutes. If you have an ice pack, a great thing, the um, ice packs for the first aid kits, the ones you just squeeze, they're a chemical pack. Um, ice vasoconstricts, that means now's the blood vessels, so that can be helpful in the clotting. You could put that over the nose and use uh, direct pressure on that as well. Emergency care, severe bleeding, blow to the head, difficulty breathing, vomiting. Those are the signs and symptoms that say, hey, we need some help. Write down the time the bleeding started. If it lasts greater than seven minutes, for sure you need some professional help. If the victim gets pale and very tired, yes, call 911. What's the next level of bleeding control? We call that packing. We're going to fully expose the wound, which may require cutting the clothing. That's why a good pair of trauma shears is worth the money to have in your car. You're going to apply firm, direct pressure. If blood has pooled in the wound, you're going to remove the excess by using some plain gauze, and then you're going to pack the wound tightly. You're going to shove that gauze into the wound until the bleeding stops and hold pressure until it arrives. You can move your fingers around and try to find the actual spot that stops the bleeding. Search around a little bit and you may be able to find the direct spot, that vessel that's broken, that's causing the bleeding. If you can put the more direct pressure you can, the better the result that you're gonna have. Um, sometimes bleeding control kits will have gauze with a special substance. We call that a hemostatic, hemo blood static to stop. So a stopping blood gauze. So it's coated with the material that helps the blood clot. So whether you have the plain gauze, which is called packing gauze, which is folded kind of like in an accordion. So it's folded down and you pull it out like an accordion and then you shove it in the wound. Here's a nice little video of how to do this. So we're gonna take the quick clot. Now quick clot is the version that has the clotting substance on it. And you can see it's folded like an accordion and she's shoving that in there and really pushing down, kind of using one hand then the other hand, one hand then the other hand. And keep going, keep going until you fill that wound. Sometimes it's just deeper than you might think it's gonna be, so she's pushing and pushing. You really want to get the other fingers on there so you're stopping the bleeding and then you're holding the direct pressure. You may want to hold it like that or you may want to hold it directly with your fingers, especially if you think you found the spot that's really preventing more bleeding to occur. Now, a tourniquet. How are we going to use a tourniquet? You're going to apply the tourniquet two to three inches above the wound. 
So clearly you're going to be using the tourniquet on the arms and legs. It's not something that you're going to use on the head, the neck, and the body. Two to three inches above the wound. So you're not going to go over the elbow or knee. So if it's high up on the forearm, you may put the tourniquet above the elbow, meaning between the elbow and the shoulder. And if it's high up in the calf, you may put the tourniquet above the knee, meaning between the knee and the hip. In the event of a traumatic amputation, the tourniquet should be placed again two to three inches above the wound so that the tourniquet doesn't slip off and so that the shortened arteries are compressed because in that horrific situation, the arteries will, things will kind of roll up. So you need to give yourself at least three inches um, above the area of the amputation. You're going to tighten the tourniquet until the bleeding stops and you're not going to remove the tourniquet. So let's go over this a little bit more. You can apply it to others or on yourself. It can be applied over clothing. Tourniquets hurt. Tourniquets hurt. I'll say it a third time. Tourniquets hurt. A second tourniquet may be required to stop the bleeding just above the first one. Above meaning closer to the armpit or closer to the groin, depending whether it's the upper extremity or lower extremity. Again, do not remove the tourniquet, and you're going to note the time that you applied it on the tourniquet. So here we go into a little bit more detail. You're going to place the tourniquet on the skin, two to three inches above the injury, but not over a joint. You're going to root that self-adhering band through the friction adapter buckle. So it's just like a belt. You're going to loop it through. You're going to remove all the slack, and then you're going to step three, feed it, and tighten it around the extremity and securely fasten it back on itself. So this is the step that is usually done wrong. Tourniquets need to be tight. So if you can tighten it with the first loop, meaning sliding it through the loop and then Velcroing it on itself, make that as tight as you possibly can. So that before you twist step four, the windlass, which is just that short rod it looks like a pen without the writing area it's just a short rod that you're going to twist and it's called the windlass so you're going to twist that and you shouldn't need more than two three maybe four twists that's why tightening it with the velcro first is so important um, it says here until the bleeding stops and the distal pulse has been eliminated so let's keep going. You're going to lock the windlass rod in place with the windlass clip. And then you're going to grasp the strap and pull it tight and adhere it to the windlass strip. So if you look at number six on the right, that is where you write the time down. Now, if you look at the pictures on the left side of this slide under the words, do not remove the tourniquet, you're going to see the distal pulse in the arm. Distal just means at the end, meaning further down toward the hand or further down toward the foot. So you can learn to take the pulse in the wrist and you can learn to take the pulse in the foot. You can see there's two different locations on a foot. It does take practice, especially the feet. It takes practice. It's worth the time to practice on your friends so you can find the distal pulse on different body types. It's very important to practice this. That's why a live class is so important. Now here's a short video on learning how to fold the tourniquet so it's ready to use. Notice I'm pulling back that piece so the windlass can get in and out of the little holder area. Um, your fine motor skills, you lose them. So having the tourniquet ready to go is important. So I'm showing you number one, you're going to loop the loop it through and fold it onto itself with a good three inches or so on it. And then you can just loop it around and that's one way to fold it. So now when I open it up, you can see it's open and ready to go. All I have to do is pull it tight, slide it over the extremity and pull it tight. Now I'm going to loop it a different way, and this is just going to give you a little larger opening. And also when you pack it, you can see I'm sliding it through and that little orange piece is going to be visible. So if I kept it in a top pocket or I had a real nice vest, I could keep it there and be visible. And you can see the opening is larger 
for a larger area like a lower extremity. Now these are the different types of tourniquets that are reviewed and approved by a committee called the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care. So these particular brands have been tested. Um, what you'll see is if you buy tourniquets on Amazon, um, what you're going to basically find is either cheap Velcro or the windlass. You can bend that windlass and snap it, whereas on these, the windlass will not snap. And here's a, another list of those approved tourniquets. Bleeding and control in children. Um, the same tourniquet can be used. And usually on an infant or very small child, direct pressure will work. For large deep wounds, you can pack the wound as well. Um, a little bit about bleeding control. This is where a live class is very helpful. Chest and abdomen, you really cannot pack these areas. You may cause more internal damage and infection. You must control for shock with a blanket. So part of your first aid kit should definitely be an emergency blanket, depending on where you are in the country. Just remember, even if it's hot, like here in Texas, when you're in shock, boom, hypothermia, less heat. That body, internal body temperature is going to go down. You want to use something called a vented chest seal. Um, you should be trained to use it. Pretty basic to use, but once again, you should see one and know how to use it. So here we have an image. You're going to need to cut or unfasten the clothing that covers the wound, expose the casualty's torso from the belly button to uh, the neck. You want to clean and dry the wound. That's why just having lots of gauze in a first aid kit is very handy. Um, wipe the blood, sweat from the skin surrounding the wound uh, to increase the occlusive, the stickiness of the seal. Uh, you want to disrupt the wound as little as possible. You're going to grab that plastic tab. All the different brands of chest seals have that plastic tab. You want to peel it away. Pretty simple to peel that away. You're going to apply it on the wound, adhesive side down. So that's going to go right on a chest, for, it, for example. Centering the vent on the wound, you're going to peel and remove the flap and firmly press the dressing to the skin. You want to make sure the dressing extends at least two inches beyond the edges of the wound. Once you get that sealed, you need to check for other wounds. God forbid it's a bullet. You want to check for the exit wound. You want to place the casualty on their side or sitting up. Monitor the bleeding and the wound seal for continued effectiveness and get that 911 call done immediately. Avoiding hypothermia like we talked about. Having one of these blankets is extremely important, even on these hot days, if you're in a state that's really hot. Uh, for Texas schools, the bleeding kits, be familiar. Be familiar. Where's your AED in, in Texas schools? Where's the bleeding kit? Where is that kept and what's in it? Last topic, impaled objects. What are you going to do? You're not going to remove it. You're just going to try to clean the area the best as you can with all that gauze that you have. And then you can use the rolled gauze to seal the other gauze around the impaled object. So a quick summary, call 911, find the bleeding area, compress with pressure or packing or use a tourniquet and get some help as soon as you can. For more bleeding, these are the sites to go to. Stop the bleed. The only thing more tragic than a death is a death that could have been prevented. Be safe.